Hello. I, uh... Yeah, yeah. that's your yeah. name. Squirrels got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really, 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 really cold and fun. Cold and fun. That's good that you think that of it because that's what deer hunting typically is, is cold and fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday morning, I'm glassing up on the pass and I see these deer moving. And I'm like, ooh, there's some deer moving. All of a sudden, I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass wearing shorts and a t-shirt with a pack on. And I'm like, I'm like, is that hard? My dad always talks about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So, so Robert's When you're the 275 pounds, I don't know how you do that, but. The Freightliner? <laughs> it's just like a creeper. He's kind of up in the corner watching what's going on down there. Yeah. You know? He's like, you know, he's up there slapping it, pissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> How did you know the name of the actor? That's right. I know. What did you say his name? Her Herve Velichos. <laughs> you know what Pertinier means? If you know what Pertinier means and you live in America, you're a redneck too. <laughs> Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast, brought to you by Pertnir Outdoors. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Log Talk with Pertnir Outdoors. This is, of course, your host, Billy. And uh, this week, I think we got another special conversation coming to you. So this is episode 54, I do believe we're on, if you want to count those two uh, long-winded bush driven conversations from last week so i hope you uh looks like a lot of you listened to those i hope you enjoyed them and got some laughs but also enjoyed some of the stories um behind uh some of the fun memorable hunts that the four of us had had together over the last few years and hopefully we'll be making more memories this upcoming fall much like that so definitely fun if you uh if you did listen to those and you haven't gone over to our Instagram page or Facebook page, head on over there. Um, I'm going to post up, I'm recording this on Saturday, but I'm going to post up some pictures that uh, I've dug up from the archives from those stories that were told. Um, I don't have pictures of Dallas and Brian's first bucks, but I do of everything else from those stories. So uh, thanks again for listening to those. And if you are new to us, as you may be, especially with doing a podcast with these guys, uh, we might have some new guests listening. So thank you for tuning in. And uh, and without further ado, this week we're joined by Mike and Lewis Price, the uh, father and son duo from Heritage Outdoor Sports over in Phelps. Uh, this is our second local bow shop uh, episode, I guess you could call it. And uh, after the first one we did with Earth Spirits, put a post out on, uh, on Instagram to see uh, what other shops locally people recommended us to sit down with, and um, Heritage was the was the number one recommended place to go sit down. So instantly got in touch with them, and uh, it was really fun. Uh, this conversation, I listened back to it, feel like uh, the conversation just flowed like we knew each other forever. Um, just awesome people. I had no no background knowledge, um, didn't know either one of them, and had no idea that that Lewis. The son, uh, young Lewis Price, was such an accomplished archer that he is, um, and how much, really, how accomplished his father is as well with his coaching and uh, everything he's done in his archery career. So, really interesting uh, couple guys, really interesting family. And uh, man, if you're from the east side of Rochester, um, even out the Syracuse way, um, if you're looking for Hoyt and Archery, or sorry, Hoyt and Matthews products. Um, definitely a bow shop I would recommend. Um, they do carry uh, a couple other brands as they talk about, but their top two sellers are Hoyt and Matthews. So um, hope you enjoy this discussion and uh, and I won't talk too much more about that. Uh, just a quick update for everyone um, on a few things that we got coming down the pipe here. I just placed another order. Uh, I placed another order a couple weeks ago, but just got the proofs in for another batch of hats. Um, so we got a couple different hats coming one uh, blaze orange rubber patch hat uh kind of it is a a trucker style but all blaze orange and then got a kind of a like a dad style my brother has another word to describe it but i won't use that here um another hat that's kind of just a, a non-structured relaxed fit hat that might uh 
might appeal to someone like my wife or even myself who's a dad um, and doesn't always want to wear a structured hat. So we've got those coming. I suspect they'll be in sometime in uh, mid to late September. Uh, so just in time for hunting season and uh, going to get some more stickers and whatnot ordered. Um, as far as uh, get togethers and things like that, uh, I've, as many, you know, I've been involved with BHA um, and a lot of the other conservation organizations around the area. Um, it's definitely a, you know, this, this COVID stuff just continues to track on and is uh, keeping it, keeping everybody away from each other and making it very hard for these organizations to do what they do and interact with, uh, with volunteers and, and people like us around the area. So make sure if your uh, if your local chapters are doing anything that you're trying to help out and get involved with them. I know that uh, September is public lands month and there will be, uh, I know BHA all over the country, they're, they're going to be doing a public land pack out. Uh, but I've was on a conference call this week with our chapter here in New York, and uh, we're going to be doing some kind of a kind of like a virtual um, educational, like a weekly live deal on Facebook and probably YouTube. So keep your eyes peeled for that. If you're a new hunter, uh, I think this will be incredibly valuable to you. We're going to, you know, all of us uh, that are involved with BHA here in New York bring different skill sets and different uh, um, interests to the table, you know, whether it be upland hunting, upland bird hunting, squirrel hunting, small game stuff, or if it's deer and bear hunting, you know, big game and uh, getting after that around our state. So it's going to be a great opportunity for all of you out there listening and anyone who wants to engage with that to uh, to tune in and ask your questions and learn and share any of your experiences as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, we are going to be brewing a beer. So I've been working with my buddy Russ up at Russ or at, uh, I want to keep on, his name is Russ. I want to say Rusty Nickel because that's a brewery as well that I've done some stuff with. Uh, up in West Seneca, but um, Windy Brew right here in Sheldon. Russ has uh, gotten pretty involved there and works there um, doing some brewing for them. And uh, so we've been talking about doing our own Pertinier Outdoors beer. So keep your eyes peeled over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to be putting up a poll uh, to see what type of flavor of beer people would like to see us do. And then we will do a naming contest and uh, and then we will start the brew right around the 1st of September. And then uh, we're going to do a release party uh, is the plan on September 30th up at Windy Brew. So that'll be Wednesday night, the night before uh, October 1st, so the night before deer season starts. So it might be a, hopefully by then. I know right now we could do, the, do it right now with the facility they have, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to do it without any worries by the end of September. Um, so mark your calendars there for a fun night and uh, we're going to be working with them to any of the proceeds from that will go uh, to a conservation organization of our choice so i think we're going to pick uh, i think we're going to do something with qdma nda i'm not sure how that's all going to work out but uh, being that we're going into deer season i'd love to to support that local uh, or that national organization but the local chapter as well so be looking into that but um, some exciting stuff here. Things are going great. Uh, work is busy. Family is busy. And uh, Pertinier Outdoors is rocking and rolling. So thank you, everybody, for your support. Hope you enjoy this chat with these guys. And uh, check us out on Instagram and Facebook for what we're up to throughout the week. And we, uh, we will always be posting a, an episode on uh, Monday morning. So thanks again for tuning in. Enjoy the discussion. Check these guys out. And keep feeding them. Wash your hands. See you later. Too low? No, sounds good. Sounds good. I think I'm going to get my phone out of there. That's going to give us some feedback. All right, sweet. Sure, you guys get headphones. I get nothing. I didn't want to overwhelm you with the technology. <laughs> All right, so today I am sitting down in the Heritage Archery Bow Shop here in Phelps. So I'm sitting with, what, did I say something wrong? That's okay. It's just Heritage Outdoor Sports. Heritage Outdoor Sports. That's all right. You have the free reign to correct me as much as you need to. And I'm being I'm nice. Here today. We haven't even got started we yet. We haven't. And so there's going to be a lot more corrections coming. So we're here at, let me get this right, Heritage Outdoor Sports in Phelps, mm -hmm. right on Route 88. Is that what you guys are on? Technically, Melvin Hill Road. Melvin but yeah. Hill Road. 
So I'm sitting down with Mike and Lewis Price. So Mike is the founder and owner of the dealership here in the, the bow shop, outdoor sports facility. And his son, Lewis, is a co-owner. Co-owner. I guess. He runs everything. He lets me sit around and do nothing. It's perfect. Yeah. Yep. You, sounds like you're living the dream, man. So we, uh, I was telling you guys before we hit record that, uh, you know, we did our first podcast with a local bow shop with uh, Earth Spirits Archery out in Warsaw and put a post up, you know, asking some other pro shops in the area that would be good to, you know, reach out to and kind of get them on to tell their story about their, their shop and what they're up to and the different services that they offer. And you guys were one of the most uh, suggested shops on that response. So um, first off, thanks for having me out here to see your place. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful place you got set up here and beautiful setting out here in the country away from the hustle bustle yeah and uh so more or less i just want to get to know you guys a little bit i've never been to this shop before i've heard of it but i've never been here so want to kind of get to know a little bit of the history of the shop as um, you guys were kind of alluding to when i got here um kind of the background on when you started it and uh what the history is with you in your archery you know in your archery career i guess is what i'm interested in and uh and then we'll kind of just talk a little bit about the different brands you guys support and the services you offer here and tell some hunting stories and yeah. I'm sure there's a bunch, there's a lot of pictures and a lot of mounts in this place. So I'm curious a little bit of the background <laughs> on some of them. So I guess Mike, I'll, yeah. I'll turn it over to you if you want to. Okay. We started, I didn't do it all. I made Louie help me with every piece. Little Louie. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's what we used to call him too. <laughs> we called him the King though. His nickname is the King, but um, we started this in 06. I was working for Hoyt and Easton and several other companies previously. Um, but uh, we started it just real small and uh, I used to have a garage that's now the retail. So it just morphed into this bigger uh, bigger retail store than, than what I really expected. Yeah, we uh, started where we're sitting now. So what is this, 16 feet wide, right? Right about 18. 18. Yep. Yep. So we started literally, the shop was right here, but now it's 30 yards indoors, but we only had 20. Okay. So we actually added on to the back. So 20 yard line was right here. So we had retail shooting in here in this little office, which is what was size. our shop. Yeah, yeah. It was a 12 by 12. Yeah. So that's where we built arrows, did all the bow work, everything. We had one press wow. and this was our front door for the shop. So it, it really small compared to what we have now, especially we can show you the back room. It's yeah. a lot bigger f to work on. Now we can hold, I don't know, 70, 100 bows out, out back yeah, if we need to. we got hooks for 74. Yeah. And um, early in the season, we'll usually fill it with 74. Uh, turnaround time gets a little crazy, you know, this time of the year. But to be honest, it, it's – what we want to do is what I always wanted to do, and Louis kept it going, was we wanted to separate ourselves from shops that use a laser and a level. You know what I mean? We wa I wanted to tune everyone's bow like it was my own bow or Louis or a buddy of ours, a professional hunter. You know, it didn't matter. I wanted everybody's from, and even our youth bows. So, yeah. But yeah, so we started off real small. I mean, really, before the building, it was in the basement. That's where he really started. But I was a pro staffer for different archery companies. So I used to go to some How'd you of get the, into that? Um, just friends. I, I really did. I met uh, um, Craig Doherty and Bob Folkrod, and uh, I just started to shoot. I had a buddy of mine that turned me on to it, Ron Wheeler, and I was just a hunter before. And... Uh, so we started shooting tournament, and it just, I just dug it. And Louie's been shooting since he's three or four years old. And every place I traveled, he traveled with me, my wife, and my other kids. And so it was a family, a family thing. And our vacations were really us shooting our bows and such. So, um, yeah. 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 So he was with Golden Eagle at, well, Yep. first right golden yep. eagle bear and then that was in the 90s, 90s. 2000s yeah so and then after they moved away he switched to jennings 
Yeah, because what Jennings. happened was uh, Golden Eagle, or the people that own Golden Eagle, bought Bear Jennings. So then we had a choice. So I shot Jennings, and a buddy of mine, Bob Folkrod, he was always the hunter. So he stayed with the Golden Eagle thing. And then when they got rid of Golden Eagle, or that name, he shot Bear. But, uh, yeah, and then it just kept evolving. Every chance I got, we tried to make a step forward or a step up. Mm -hmm. You know, going to work for Hoyt and Easton was one of the most exciting things I think I ever did. I ever did, because we know that company and I know the people behind it. And it, I'm telling you, they're family and they believe in archery. It's not to them. It's not just stamping out bows and making money. Yeah. You know, they want to be profitable, just like we want to Every be profitable. Every business needs to think that way. Yeah. They're really techy guys, and that's kind of where I come from in Louis, where. The machines that are out back in our shop, I mean, we have a press out front. We have two one, up, two, three, three out presses out back. We built a string machine before people were building string machines. Yeah, that's huge. So, I'll show you that too. Yeah. yeah. Yep. yeah. We, we have a friend, Bruce. He was, he's a mechanic. He does everything, really. He's retired now, so he helps us out. But him and his buddy, when he, they were still working, built, or, you know, we got all the parts together for them, and they built the string machine, so it's pneumatic, so you get to... Pr I mean, we could put 800 to 1,000 pounds of pressure, really, on it if we wanted to, probably. Yeah. So, wow. if we want... I mean, that's a little too much. Yeah, but, right. It's not necessary. But, yeah, but this thing is huge. It's uh, the aluminum beams the, uh, that we got from a sign, our well, neighbor. Well, from a, another friend yeah. of ours. But what it, the joke around here is that he wrote it right on the machine. It's, yeah another one of Mike's little projects. <laughs> but so it's huge. <laughs> what I do is I come up and draw this stuff and go, wow, this could really be cool. And Bruce goes, okay. And he pretty much, him and Tom, got all the parts. We just yeah. drew it out and said, hey, I wanted to do this and I wanted to do that. Made it happen. And, uh, yeah, they made it happen. Because even so. the other parts that are out back, archery, as far as I'm concerned, is antiquated as far as tools. Yeah. It's starting to catch up. But we built a bunch of the tools that are out back so we could really fine tune our equipment and, and our customer base. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't use that string machine that much anymore, but just on repairs or if people want us to make strings. But now we use other companies that, you know, we don't have to worry about it. No liability on us. Things right. like that. So. Um, and just trying to keep up. Yeah. Trying it's to keep up. Yeah. If you're trying to custom yeah. build every string, that's just. I mean, uh, two years, I think two years ago. I did all the strings that we put through here. I mean, before, though, I so we, we started off with first string. Um, that was four or five years ago. We did the, them for two years straight, I believe, and they just got a little bit behind, like too long of weights. So, you know, but before then, we were making them. He taught me. I was making strings probably when I was little, 13, 14 years old. And so um, did that, and he went – but then was all by hand. So you have a 90 inch solo cam string and you have uh, probably half of that at least in serving. It takes a long time. I can imagine. All by hand too, oh it's, it's nuts. So that's when we decided, or he decided to design the string machine. So we did that and then it was a lot faster. It went from three hours per string, you know, whole tune to probably hour, hour and a half. So cut the time in half. That's is, significant, yeah. yeah. And depending on the bows, some bows are easier than others, obviously. And, you know, less serving, you know, things like that. Some smaller strings. But, yeah, so just evolved from one thing to the next and yeah. keep doing it. So, What was the what was the jump for you to, to start your own shop, you know, being that you were, you know, you were repping a couple things and on well, pro staff? I was traveling. And to be honest, I got a little bit sick. You know what I mean? I've got this goofy thing that makes me breathe funny. So I'm like an 80-year-old man and a holy cow. I'm still old, so I can't even say that. I was going to say young you look man's, good, though. Young man's body, <laughs> yeah. but that's not working for me. <laughs> so, and really what it did was, you know, I, I really believe that the good Lord was looking out for us, and, and he opened the door for this to work, and, and it really exploded. And it's tough, you know what I mean? I've learned a ton of good lessons, and Louis, to be honest, when he took uh, managing the store over, it was it was really good for me because he was able to bring me back to the passion that I kind of lost through mm -hmm. retail's tough, yeah. you know. And so, but what happened was, 
another piece morphed and Lewis took it over because we started an academy when I started this place. We were always training youth. And um, so what I wanted to do, because Lewis is a professional archer, he won't tell you, but he's he's one of the top archers in the world, not just the United States. Ah, so, damn, Lewis. And uh, so the thing is that I wanted to build a whole bunch of Louis. And what happened was we got a whole smattering of a whole different group of kids, kids that didn't have sports for themselves. And so it became more of a, a passion-driven thing. And our motto for Heritage Archery Academy was changing lives one boat at a time because it gives a kid something to do, gives them a sport, gives them, and with the sport, gives them confidence and, mm -hmm. and lets them grow. So he allowed me to really go after this coaching thing. And I've always had a passion for coaching. Even when we had the shop, yeah. I was traveling around with Alexander Kriloff. Um, he uh, works for PSE. He's a wonderful coach. And Larry Wise and, and anybody that I could get in front of that was a lot smarter than me, which was very easy, I, I took classes from him. And um, now... Um, I'm a level four certified USA coach. I'm one of the USA red team coaches. I was just down at Lancaster Archery, who to be honest with, um, they've partnered with us, Rob Coffold and Heather and everybody down there has helped us build our feeder range. Awesome. So it's, it's really, he's allowed it to grow into this next step and where it goes, we're gonna let it just go there. Yeah. Cause out back, I don't mean to tie up all the time, but we have a full 3D course. Um, I have a pop-up target system at our tower, and our tower is not just one uh, eight by eight platform. That thing's huge. <laughs> our yeah. tower has three 12 foot by 12 foot platforms, one at 11 feet and two at approximately 16 feet because that's the average height for a bow hunter in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm up a little taller, but yeah. that gives people an, uh, an idea of how to shoot down because that's what we do here in the northeast yeah. but there's buttons all along the handrail and you push a button and all of a sudden targets start moving no kidding that's something he designed too that's really cool 10 years ago i think yeah At and that least. came from folk rod though because yeah. we had bob folk rod and golden eagle had a hunting school in pennsylvania that i was blessed enough to be able to coach and teach at and bob had a pop-up system and i was like man this is the cat's meow but we had to run it so I came up with an idea, and another gentleman, Jim, um, actually, you Man, know, fashion. another idea, he actually built it for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got a business out of Palmyra, and man, he, he did a great job. That's awesome. And it's still running. Yeah. And what we did was we ran power for, and air from here down to the tower, which is, oh my gosh, it's gotta be 600 feet. That's a long way, yeah. yeah. But it makes it so hunters can shoot and we can time the animals this this isn't where the animals go up and go down right away we're not that's not what we're looking for yeah i'm looking to get somebody's heartbeat up so it's simul simulates a hunting scenario mm -hmm. and that's what we did so mm -hmm. but then we have a 14 target field course it's we tore up right now yeah, but <laughs> but and we have just i'm just finishing our 20 target feeder range and that is for so when the U.S. team comes here, when the red team comes, or when we start having more USA shoots, we have every single genre or facet of archery that you can think of. We have it here. You can shoot it. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. so, so is that when you talk of the feeder range, that's those giant black the round targets yeah, the round that are down yeah, there? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Because yes. I saw that when I first got here, I'm sitting out there on the phone, and I'm, like, trying to think of, like, are those huge coils of, like, like corrugated uh, dr like yeah. drainage pipe? And then I'm like, oh no, those are targets. Like yeah. I'm putting it all together as I'm sitting there looking at it. So that's that's awesome. Like that's yeah. a huge so open space back there. Yeah, what we did, he had a buddy of ours level it out so it's you know, because back there is kind of dips and stuff. So now we can shoot. I mean, if we backed up to here, we could shoot 150 yards probably, <laughs> but we don't need to shoot that far. But you know, so if yeah, you, if you want. Though. Yeah. But the feta with the shoots we go to, it's 50 meters for. Um, all compounds besides younger younger divisions and then the recurves are 70 70 meters so we wanted to make sure we had enough room so we took a bunch of trees down things like that so now whoever wants to come here they can it's not just I mean we're 95% hunting realistically but we have that 5% 
I mean, we got everything in the 5%. So yeah. people could come do whatever they want. It's not just hunting. So yeah. that's that's a nice thing about what and we try I, to and do. And I think it's growing because mm-hmm. we have people that are come from out of state to get coached. Because the other thing that we've developed is when I first started coaching with Alexander, we he would use a handheld camera, a VHS camera, and we would put it on the guy's release hand, and the guy would focus on his release hand. So I developed a video system that has six cameras, so there's cameras everywhere. So the archer can't focus on one, and so we started that. The first one was built, I built it inside these walls. So it was like security cameras. And that didn't work as well as I wanted. And I'm a musician, so I took all my mic stands and I put cameras on the mic stands. Okay. So, and then once that, once I refined it a little bit, I built it like four more times, something stupid. And then we started doing a gig out at Yankton, Mm -hmm. which is a wonderful facility. Thank thank you, Easton. Thanks, Jim. Where's that? And Greg? Yankton, South Dakota. Yankton, South Dakota. It's in the middle of nowhere, but this facility, they can shoot 100 yards indoors. And they just added to it like two years ago now. That's the Easton facility? Yeah. yeah. That's, I think one one that's only they one, have one of them. They have one in Utah, right? Yep. Yeah. That's okay. the, I think I've seen that that's one. That's the yep. biggest one, I think. But then they have one in Gainesville, Florida also. Okay. And I think that's it. Well, technically they have one in um, Chula Vista, California, yes. too, for yep. the yep. Uh, yep. Olympic Center. But, but yeah, that place is humongous. They just added a huge spot that's only 50 – or, no, 60 yards for the shooting line. I mean, if they have chairs and stuff in the back and – you know, uh, concession stands, stuff like that. But that place is humongous. It's it's really awesome. The people there are great, too. And th- they're the ones that run uh, Vegas, that shoot, and okay. all the big ones. So that's uh, really nice. But, yeah, we did the Yankton. Well, he does the well, Yankton coaching. Well, the whole thing is that, again, Lewis, I'm getting older, right, and I'm starting to wane, and retail's getting to me. And with him having a passion for archery because he quit on me for like six months or a year once and i was, I was like school. what the <laughs> heck you know what am i going to do seemed like but an eternity <laughs> that, then he came back with a with a vengeance and he started doing these things and a, a friend of ours larry wise who is one of my mentors um was doing a camp in yankton so Louis signed up and i said hey can i come in and just hang out and so i got there and i said i want to help so we started um, the, the camp, and then the next year I brought the video system, and it was a hit. So we've brought it pretty much every year, and uh, now it's been duplicated. Some other people are using the same kind of technology, but multi-camera systems, yeah. even for hunters, though. See, the hunters don't take advantage I of it. I could use that thing big time. <laughs> well, and yeah. what it is, and it's not a way for us to pick on you. What it is, it's a way for us, even the archer, yeah to discover what's going on yeah. it's you, better when, sorry go, go ahead no no you go okay it's better for somebody to see themselves do it instead of being told yeah because not a lot of people like being told something they're doing wrong you well know and, it, I mean? and so. it helps you if you're the individual is doing it it helps you to understand what somebody's telling you that you're doing because it's very yeah. hard until you see it to understand what yep. they're saying and how so to like correct i'll it. use the example of when i was uh i graduated high school in 06 so like that was a time when a lot of technology was starting to come up and I was I was played baseball in high school and went played baseball in college and that was when people started doing like films to send to schools as like here's your your like your pro day or your you know throwing mm-hmm. or whatever your position is and that's when I started becoming very aware of what I was doing as a pitcher was by the video you know somebody was just holding a camcorder and looking at you but that visual feedback of what you're doing is just so important and you go out there, like, you just take archery. You go out there in the backyard, and if you've got 20 minutes and you shoot 20 arrows and you're not sure exactly why you're doing what you're doing but you're making a mistake, you, like, you put your arrows away and you go back away. Yeah. And you're not really making those improvements. Mm-hmm. And that's where the more I've gotten into archery, like, you guys are asking me, like, I here if I do my own tuning or if I take my bow somewhere. Like, you only have so many hours in the day. Mm-hmm. But I want to get better. And for me, it's visual is everything. So, like – that's pretty sweet you have that video system. Yeah. I think that's something that people should absolutely take advantage of, you guys having something like that here to come and work with you and get video of yourself, get that breakdown, understand what you're doing, what the proper technique is. And, you know, we were when I walked in here, you are busting my chops about wearing the knock-on shirt. But I 
he did he did that uh school of knock yeah. series on oh, yeah. youtube yep. and i i learned so much about myself in that and how many things i i didn't know i mean i grew up around hunting my dad had my brother and i out back shooting you know the the plastic recurve bows as soon as we could do it mm-hmm. but there was not a lot of and i think you know you guys you guys are you're a unique family where it's like you knew the right way and you were teaching him how to do it the right way like we're hunters right dad yeah. took us out in the backyard and i don't know is that he really knew what the form was somebody gave him a bow and said start shooting and mm-hmm. i think that's most people so like me watching that video series with dudley i'm like wow like how you pull, lift your bow up and how yeah. your feet are arranged and how your angles are like yeah. no idea nobody ever told yeah. that yeah so th- just that little thing right there made a huge impact on me but then having a, a pro shop like you guys that somebody can come in and actually do that stuff with you watching and yeah. get that coaching it's invaluable yeah, yeah. that's because what we honestly we pride ourselves off of like when somebody comes by a new bow and they're either brand new or been doing it for 30 years we offer them a lesson mm-hmm. you know it's just a lesson what we you know the basics, like you're saying, the stance, angles, hand position, those things, they're really basic, but they can make a world of a difference on a hunter, especially even a tournament person. Like, you can change a lot of things uh, very easily with the basics. So we always do that when they come in because if they don't want it, that's fine. Mm-hmm. If you want to shoot the way you shoot, that's okay. But how we look at like when when he goes to um, listen to other coaches to learn more things, you can always pick something up no matter – who you are or wh- you know what you do and how well you oh shoot yeah. i mean there's things i pick up from him from other shooters that i go shoot with across the world like you can just pick up things like it's that simple and yeah. i think people should always take advantage of those things because you could always make yourself better so that's what we try to try to do a lot um and then shoot on the range where you're actually seeing how you impact and then still moving things around makes a big difference on people yeah um and that's what we try we, we want people to be the best they can be not just to sell them a bow and get out of here like mm-hmm. no you know, i don't want you to wound a deer and shoot it in the butt but i want you to heart shoot that sucker and make it drop in 20 yards you yeah. know that's yeah. simple yeah so that's that's huge and i hope people that are listening understand that you know not every and that's why i'm finding is that not every pro shop is built the same you know, and, and you might get one thing from one that you don't get from another. Mm-hmm. But if you can get that feeling where you come in and they're, you know, I've been in, in shops before where you walk in there and you just feel like you're you're just another customer in the door. And if you can get that, I got that feeling the minute I walked in here, you, know, you greet me at the door and it's like, no, like you're, we're here to talk about whatever, but you're looking to build a relationship yeah. and to help that individual feel comfortable and get into a bow and whether it's they're buying a bow or they're bringing a bow here to get it tuned mm-hmm. you know you have the facility and you have the knowledge and i had no idea what your guys' background was in your experience like these yeah. are two guys sitting right next to me that are huge wells of knowledge on archery and and speaking of relationships before john dudley calls <laughs> i just want you wearing a heritage shirt yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh that's so, fine no. if john dudley listens to this i've made it holy okay, shit. All right. oh my god send we'll it send to him. it to him or yeah. something <laughs> so um yeah it, it's been very interesting for me to watch you know, talking about the dudley side of things um what the i've been you know, i'm engaged in social media and watching things and it there's like the the hipness of archery is like coming back around mm-hmm. and i think it's an awesome opportunity we all have to capture people that are intrigued and interested and especially right now i was telling you when i got here of a couple of my buddies that are getting into archery that never in a million years would i have suspected that they'd be taking their hunter safety course yeah. and wanting to go out and Do harvest something. an animal this fall. Mm-hmm. So it's catching on and it's important. Uh, also before we hit cord, it's just, it's in the point I'm making is that having a place to go to build that relationship and find those, whether it's a mentor or somebody to teach you or educate you, you can go to the big box store, but if you're right off the, right off the gate, they might sell you. Th- I mean, you can go to Walmart, you can go to Cabela's or Bass Pro. They can sell you a bow, but you're just not going to get, yeah, the education and the attention to yeah. detail that you're going to get from a place like this. There are some guys, because we know one guy used to have an archer shop back in the day. He works at Bass Pro. and um, So he knows a little bit, but, you know, not your average Bass Pro has the average bow hunter, or I guess the average bow hunter. So 
you could get somebody guy f- from the boating department to come over and sell you a boat or the clothing department. Yeah. Like they might not know anything. So. It's the attention to detail. Yeah. You know, like yeah. if you're somebody who you've got a price point and they have a ready to shoot bow and that's what you want to do, that's great. Go yeah. buy your bow there. But you need to go to a place mm-hmm. like this that where you yeah. can get that education and get that knowledge yeah. built. From we would love doing. them to come here buy a bow, but if they can't, then that's fine. Yeah. But we still, if you want a lesson, that's what we're, like we said before, that's what we like. So come on in and that's we can set up a time he does times all the time for lessons you can sign up online and things so we try to do a lot of that well and the whole thing is that you know it is it, it for me it was a little frustrating because guys would bring bows in and all the accessories and it's like really you know and we're trying to make a living at it so i i started to beg people please buy it all here i'll we'll do extra stuff but now it's really changed. COVID has changed everything even more because it taught us all how to buy online, myself included. Mm-hmm. So we don't care if they bought it wherever. Louis's been instrumental in changing my mind when it comes to this stuff because I'm a miserable old man sometimes. <laughs> but but so the thing is, like, if they do buy something somewhere else and they come here, we're not just going to treat them like a customer still. Like, we're going to want them to be our friends, come back again, either to buy something or to get a lesson or even just to shoot our courses out back. Like, yeah. we just want people here. So even if they do do that, I mean, we're we're always going to accept people to come in. I mean, it doesn't, right. it doesn't really matter. It does help us live our life better, you know, with more customers and making more money. But mm-hmm. if somebody can't afford, if our price points are not low enough, then we understand, you know, yeah. and we can still help them out in other ways. Right, and that's... And that's one of the things. That's a good point because we do have price points from two ninety nine. You know, beginner bows. We just don't have that Mart bow that's one hundred and fifty dollars. And that's where I have a problem because if I can't tune and shoot that bow, you know, the how cheap the hell bows, is somebody else going to? And yeah. it's like holy cow! Because I think it's especially for a kid. I have a real passion for youth, and. What happens a lot of times is the, the dad will have, and I'm not picking on any dads, I don't want anybody to call me, but they have $2,000 worth of gear and they buy their kid a $50 bow and go, yeah, no, that's good enough. But if the kid can't hit the spot or can't hit the target, they're going to be discouraged and walk away from a sport that I think changes the lives of those those kids. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's so it's real important that, you, you you walk that line of, you know, whatever your price point is, tell Louie because he can usually get you there. But this thing will tune. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? That's why we do certain certain manufacturers that I really believe in. And I'm a hard head. Like I said, Louie's really good with this stuff. But uh, it's hard to beat some of the manufacturers that we have in our store. Hoyt is one of them that I just don't have problems with them. Yeah. I don't. I just don't have warranty problems with them. I don't have problems with them. Mm-hmm. And Matthews, Matthews hasn't been that one. either. Yep. I mean, yep. we've had them for not as long as Hoyt in the shop, just because we were starting off, and there's other other shops around. But I think we've had them since since we opened. No, Matthews. I'm talking about. Oh, Matthews. Like 2010, maybe. Gosh, it's been a long time. Yeah. yeah. So at least 10 yep. years. But even with them, we we knew Hoyt and Matthews always going to be one and two yeah pretty much i mean top five at least depending on the year i guess but um other companies we just don't worry about because we've tuned the bows before and if like he said if we can't tune it not saying we're the best tuners ever but if it's just not a good bow to tune Mm -hmm. then why would we sell it i I don't want to put a piece of junk in your hand if i'm not going to shoot it i don't want you to shoot it so that's the thing we don't we sell cheaper stuff from those companies i mean they make bows like he said 299 and up just for bare bow but you know those bows are going to shoot and they'll they will last a long time yeah so that's the biggest difference between box store price point versus our price point i yeah. guess and that's something i mean that's how it works with uh you know you go to these big box stores you can buy let's just use like pse or bear they have a lot of stuff you can get the big box stores mm-hmm. you may not be getting the same the same uh quality product on a big box store ready to shoot as you are if you buy one of their you know st- like pro shop end models it's mm-hmm. not like it's like buying a john deere tractor you can go to the john deere dealer and get a john deere 
or you can go to Lowe's and get a garden John Deere tractor that's yeah. not you can just by stepping on it you can tell it's not the same yeah. quality product yeah so yeah I mean that's and one of the things that came up in my conversation with uh and I don't think it was on air we talked for like an hour and a half when I was at Earth Spirits just off air like off record stuff but one of the things they talked about and I think it's an important thing for people to realize is that as a dealer a lot of people think oh you guys just have you have a, you know what do you got how many bows do you have out there new bows mm-hmm. right now not too many we're yep. selling out quite a bit but i mean like normally, on average what we do you have normally a couple have? hundred bows so a couple yeah. hundred bows a lot of people from the outside looking in look at that and say oh well you don't have to pay for them until you sell them oh man uh uh-uh. that is such a misnomer and that's yeah. the same way i work for a school bus dealership those vehicles are bought yep. they're on our so every day that they sit there that's, less that's money interest that's less yep. money that's so it's important for people to understand that just because you guys have 200 bows out there doesn't mean that you know you're just you have no overhead and everything else like you guys got to move that stuff yep and that's why towards like this part of the year like we sold out of our matthews we don't stock a lot of them but we do stock a decent amount in the beginning of the year but Mm -hmm. once we run out yes we will order more but like you said we have to pay for those so it's hard to order another 20 and have them sit here because what if i don't sell them by october 1st because usually after october 1st nobody's coming in to buy a new bow not much the bow blew up or something yeah exactly (laughs) So, yeah, it's and usually we have one or two. And yeah. And the thing is that we're we after being in since 06. So we've been in for a little bit now and uh, we've learned to try to figure out what's going to happen next year. So we try to forecast everything. Good luck with that. Well, you know what? <laughs> and we've really been blessed. I'm yeah. going to say it because I'm not good. that smart. And <laughs> th- but the whole thing is that like even this year, you know, something inside us, we're like, man, put the brakes on a little bit. And this is before all this stuff hit. And so we were like, you know what, Lou, yeah. we're going to be conservative this year. We're, you know, we have to keep it because I don't, I, I don't, I know I have to take a risk. You know, we're taking a risk by buying all this stuff. If we don't sell it, we're in trouble and we're out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the shops, the sad thing that we have going on is like guaranteed archery. Todd Guerin, I used to shoot for that guy. Or shoot on a team for him. I got the trophy in my office, and Todd Todd closed. Did and it's, there's a whole bunch of shops that are starting to close that have been around forever. He was around he, since '90s. Oh my gosh, yeah. And he was. I shot leagues there with my wife, and it was wonderful. So, but what's happening is, um, with Amazon and and other ones. Not that anybody's bad. But the margins in this stuff starts to drop. You're, you're a businessman. You yeah. sell buses, right? Yeah. As the margins get smaller and smaller, it's harder and harder to make a living, especially at something like this. Because Unless your sales are going up and up every yeah, year, yeah, which yeah. doesn't happen no. in any industry. No. Right. But, but the whole thing is that it's just, uh, is it going to end? I don't think so because I love it too much, and I think Louie does too. Yeah. But that's why we've, we haven't split up. You know, but with, I'm really pushing the coaching thing, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. we're and I think keep too, moving that forward. With all this COVID stuff going on this year, I think we're going to see an uptick in the outdoor industry just because the city people, and not just city people, but um, the people that are always going to do sports and all these things that they can't do now, and maybe they're going to be you know, weary that maybe I shouldn't have my kid go here for the next so many years. You know what I mean? Right. So. I think those people are going to try to find something else they can do together, but outside, or with even other people outside and not, yeah. you know, in a gymnasium with 500 people, <laughs> you know, sitting there. Like, yeah. that's not going to happen for a long time. So I think it's going to help not just us, but everybody the in whole general. whole industry. Yeah. It's Which an opportunity for us all to, everybody, mm-hmm. you know, like every ship rises the tide or whatever the hell that saying is. Like, everybody, we just got to help. Yeah. boost it because this is an opportunity yeah you know and on the it was not uh yeah it was last week's episode of the podcast i had a guy on and we talked a lot about you know conservation funding and things like that i'm not on the side of like funding of conservation groups and like you have a qdma cup like giving to qdma but talking about how there's excise taxes on all the stuff that people right. buy mm-hmm. if they buy it through the right channel mm-hmm. you know if you're going online and you're buying something you know, Amazon is kind of dicey because, you know, there's some stores that, you know, like so some dealerships there. might sell off there. But you go on somewhere like eBay, it can be the same. But there's a lot of direct-to-consumer stuff where, you know, somebody could buy a whole bunch of lighted knocks 
on eBay is coming right straight from China, mm -hmm. bypassing the whole system. Mm -hmm. And it, it might us. save you five bucks, but that five bucks, that five bucks difference is hurting the local dealer and it's hurting conservation yeah. because that excise tax is yeah. going to paid. No, and right. that's what I meant by hurt us. I mean, it's hurting everything. Yeah, the whole system. Yeah. But a lot of people have zero understanding, and I didn't until I heard about it. Yeah. They don't teach you that. They don't no, teach they you don't. that, you know, yeah. when you buy that new Hoyt bow, that there's right off the top, before you even see it, there's an excise tax yep. put on it. And yep. that manufacturer's paying that. Well, if you start cutting corners and, every, and that's happening because it's business, mm -hmm. somebody's going to find a way to get right to that person who's buying yeah. it. And you're seeing more and more of that, even with big outdoor companies. You know, they're yeah. like, they're starting another company just to sell directly to consumer. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that they're, you know, they're getting their excise tax yeah. paid. But, but like you're saying, the stuff buying from China, you know, people, yeah, they might save five bucks, but guarantee that pro that product from China is going to break before the product made here just because that's what usually and happens. And the hardest thing is, I don't know how you feel about this, but like broadheads are my my biggest, I don't pet know, peeve. catch or pet peeve because um, the blades, I want them to be sharp, yeah, like stupid sharp. Mm -hmm. So I'm scared of them when I put them on. And I'm not going to name manufacturers, but um, there's manufacturers that are, these are assembled and packed in the United States, but they're not made there and they're not using good blades. So the blades are just not as sharp as the other ones. Mm -hmm. I want them to be so sharp that I'm afraid of them. Yeah. And, and is it, uh, it's out of respect for the animals too. I love to kill stuff. Yeah. That gets my heart beating. I'm <laughs> in. Amen to that. I'm brother. in. Yeah. So, but. I want to do it as efficiently and as effectively as I can. So for us as a store owner, uh, w holy cow, one year we get great broadheads, and the next year I get a pack of broadheads and take them out and put them, because we, like, we put them on for customers. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll spin to them. We'll do a whole bunch of things. Take them out, and I can touch them and put them on. I'm like, what is up with that? Then I take a year-old pack is what happened to me, and I put them on and cut myself. And I was like, uh, Something's there's obviously here. a problem. Yeah. And, and people trying to make more money, yeah, they cutting the corners, you know, that sure. kind of stuff. And it hurts an American other made. people. Yeah. I'm just going to be old and just say, Dude, you know what, if I can get it here, because in tree stands, it's almost impossible. You know what I mean? Because we cannot compete with the industry overseas no. to, to build them here. Hopefully that's going to change, but if and I that all changes with us, the consumers, you know, yeah. like that we're the ones with the power of that. If you yeah. keep supporting those companies and supporting they that grow. stuff we made over there, they grow, and the that's companies harder. who are American made and are creating a product, they fail because they're not producing enough and yeah. not selling enough. And what? So, like, out of curiosity, what are your, uh, what are you guys running for, Broadheads? Just curious. Well, this year I was gonna when we first started the year off, that new G5 M3 came out. And that looked like a really nice head. The Montec's been great forever. So it's the same thing pretty much, just non-vented. Mm -hmm. So I was going to do that, but then a customer came in and told me about the Annihilator. And uh, I looked into it, watched a whole bunch of YouTube videos, things like that. And I was like, okay, I'll try some. So we actually became a dealer, so we ordered a bunch of them. They actually just came in on Saturday. And they're a little bit small, but... They're supposed to be really durable, easy to resharpen, things like that. So I'm going to try those this year. Um, those are fixed blade? Yep, fixed blade. Um, they have like a system where the machining is like concaved a little bit in mm -hmm. the in between. So when you punch it into the deer, it's supposed to like expand with, you know, the air and the pressure. Sure. So I'm going to try them out, see how they fly. But anything, I mean, we've, I've tried at least... I don't even know how many different products, but I went from the Kill Zone one year by NAP, which loved that over Rage, honestly, because they, at the time, Rage still had the O rings. Yeah, there's no collars on the yeah. Kill Zones, yeah. Yeah, so they were nice and easy. Lock them in, boom, ready to go. So I did that. I shot the um, Dead Meats also by G5. Killed one of my biggest, well, my biggest buck ever with a bow with that. Didn't hit him that well, but did enough job to put him down within 50 yards. So. That worked. And then we've done a bunch. I mean, I used to use the Striker when I was younger. He used the Montec. And then we've used we've used Slick Trick. Well, I haven't, but he, I think you have, right? Yep. Yeah, and, and um, if I was going to pick today, I would do it strictly by sharpness. I don't care if it's a mechanical or a fix. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's got to be sharp. 
-hmm. you know, and, and that's always the pushback. I'd shoot the G5. I want to shoot that four-bladed that they came oh, up with. Oh, yeah, the, the X. Yeah, Striker, uh, Striker X. X. Yep. New four-blade. And uh, because I, and again, we know that company. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I know those guys. They're, they're United States. It, that stuff's made here. Mm -hmm. They're really it's using German Lutz blades. That's sharp stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, and that's important to me, you know, and I'm always going to go back towards fixed because I just believe they save me when I make a poor oh, shot. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I so mean, I you, really, you can use anything as long as you make a good shot and put it where you need to put it. Because yeah. the people that are like, oh, I used a fixed blade, didn't go through, through anything. And it's like, or there's no blood trail and the deer went 200 yards and I couldn't find it. It's like, well, did you put it right where you're supposed to put it? Or did you hit it in the guts and, you know, whatever? Yeah, the so arrow go in six inches yeah. and stop. I mean, really, you could take a judo point and probably kill a deer if you wanted you can take to. You hit it in the right spot. If yeah. you take a, f a field point, shoot that thing through both lungs, it's going to die. Not that I want anybody <laughs> to do that. Yeah, well, it's not legal. Because <laughs> we hear it all the time. That's, I put it in a perfect, I, and can you help me track it? And it's like, buddy, I can promise you, there's, if you put it in the perfect spot, if you double lung that animal, because I'm not going to try to heart shoot him. I want to take both lungs out because he's dead in seconds. Yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, so we get that all the time. And, and the thing is, we never want to offend anybody. But that's where me being on the coaching side I want people to use the facility we have. We, when Louie was little, he was climbing up 18 feet on telephone poles and we were hanging boards. And his mom might know about it now <laughs> after hearing this podcast, That's but awesome. it wouldn't have been real good then. No, yeah. so it's not important. What's yeah. important is he's all right. Yeah, he's, he's turned into a nice young man. He only fell once, yeah. it was no big deal. Yeah, I mean, that explains some things, but. <laughs> <laughs> you got, have you heard of a company uh, named Iron Will yeah. Outfitters? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I've been using them for two years now. This will be my third year going into, and I just love those broadheads so much. We've had a couple of customers get them. They are, I mean, just incredibly sharp. I've shot uh, three deer with them. Those deer had no clue what hit them. Mm -hmm. um, heavy arrow, and that broadhead is just devastating. In the last two does I've shot with it, um, hit them both one lung, and I swear to you, you know, after reflecting back on it, both those deer, when I hit them, they took like three, four bounds and just stopped and looked around. Yeah. And they didn't know what hit them because it was, they were close shots and they were quartering mm -hmm. and came in high and went out low and got one lung. And, uh, and neither one of them went a hundred yards before they died. Yeah. But it was only one lung and you could hit one. I've hit them before one lung. And you have a rodeo, yeah. but I think those deer, the, that arrow going through them so fast and it's so sharp mm -hmm. that they don't know what's going on, and it just stops them for that one minute. Yeah, and then they start losing blood, and they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So it's, and they've got a lifetime warranty on them, and yeah. that's that to me is invaluable because I tr I use that on the first deer I shot with it was a buck, and the arrow went so f so f through them so fast it drove right in the hill behind them and hit a rock and it knurled over the tip. Okay, and I. After the season was over, I sent him an email and I sh sent him a picture of it and said, you know, I'm like, well, let's see if they cover this under warranty. Yeah. And they just asked for my mailing address, sent me a whole new blade, and you just take the set screw out and put the new blade in, and you got Perfect. your bleeders. And so I, it's like, yeah, I spent a hundred bucks on that on those three broadheads, yeah. but all intents and purposes, they should yeah. last me about as long as I want to use them. Mm -hmm. So an American made like small company yeah and like and i think if you're in the place and i was messing with my buddy last night who just got started in archery if you you know he said to me he goes he goes buy once cry once yep. you know and if you can think that way you know buy quality you're not going to cut corners you might spend a little bit more money but you're not going to have to be replacing that stuff All year after year after year yeah. from wear and tear you yep. know so it's something to think about you know mm -hmm. support your american companies you're getting most often very yeah. high quality goods yep not a lot of people are going to want to spend that much on them, but they no. are. I've heard from plenty of people, what customers, and then also people I sh uh, shoot with. Uh, Brandon Reyes, he bought them one year. He was like, this is the most I've ever spent on a broadhead. And he, he was going on a moose hunt, mm -hmm. and he said it just worked wonders on the moose. Like it was, He said it was awesome. Yeah. So he said he'll never go back to anything else. So and if you, if you take the look at it, if you're going to go and buy – x brand broadheads almost all of them are between 30 dollars and 60 dollars for mm -hmm. a three pack mm -hmm. if you have to buy a new three pack every year 
yeah. two sets of broadheads, you're already to the same price point. Yeah. So it's all, you know, yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to. You got to go. Yeah. Okay. So goodbye, world. Yeah. It was awesome talking to you. Yeah. And Louis, Are you leaving, Louis leaving, or do you got somebody meeting you here? I got to go out back and finish my range. Okay. All right. Well, we'll miss you. It's been awesome getting to know you. Yeah, I'll be back later. All right. And there he goes. Off into the sunset. Yep. So that's what's he working on back there right now, getting the that big course ready or um yeah, so we, the cut, field we had to cut some more trees down this year. Um we had the ash borer come through mm. and we cut like fourteen trees now. We still have some more to cut down, a lot more. So um he's just he leveling things off, things like that. So we had a stump grinder here, I think it was last week. Yeah. Not this past, not yesterday, but the week before on Sunday he got one and did that. So yeah, and I'll have to, I'll take you back there and show you. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's just doing that. He's got some stuff he wants to get done. <laughs> he's always got stuff to get done. <laughs> Especially we have friends that uh, let him borrow like a backhoe and stuff. And when he gets that stuff, he's just yeah. If he didn't have the project plan, he yeah. does it anyway. <laughs> so yeah, looking for something yeah. to tear apart. Exactly. It's awesome. Yeah, it's cool seeing the dynamic between you guys, and uh, I had no idea the relation um, and how mm -hmm. the shop was set up and organized, so that's pretty cool, father and son duo, yeah. and that you kind of grew up around this place and oh, yeah. worked your way into it. So did you uh, did you go off to, to school for business or anything? Uh, or did No, you? I wish I did. Yeah. Um, I actually, when I was younger, I thought I wanted to be you know mechanical engineer, design archery equipment. I wanted to do that, but then going through school, I never <laughs> – cared for school you know i made it through fine whatnot but never put effort into it so there was always archery hunting and so i always did that forever and then senior year came around you know crazy time of your life so sure didn't shoot i don't think i really shot at all i think i shot that year i shot two tournaments and it was after i grad like after school was done i went and shot hunter division for ibo um i went to erie I set my bow up on a Monday, went on a Thursday, <laughs> took second. It's like, okay, perfect. Qualified for Worlds. Didn't shoot, ev like, after that, went to Worlds. Took fourth. <laughs> after what? Th yeah, after that, I was like, okay, I'm I'm done with cause he af with a uh, hunter class. If you take top uh, nationals, if it's top five, I forget what it is. They kick you out of hunter class because it's so competitive every year. They yeah. don't want people just coming back and back, so – they kick people out. So I did that. And then after that, I just got more serious about shooting. It was just, you know, senior years. Oh, yeah. If you're a kid, take the time to enjoy, enjoy that because you only yeah. get it once. Yeah. And you don't realize it until 10 years down the road. It's like, man, those are some great times. Mm -hmm. I wish I did more, you know, things like that. Not worrying so. about inventory and whether yeah. you're selling stuff. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's a nice thing. I, I'm pretty, pretty lucky. Um, my parents let me do do that and not really work i mean i worked a little bit but before that i was always working in here this i never had another job that's hilarious. like literally i've never worked for anybody else besides friends helping friends so i've been really really lucky to just do this and not have to worry about anything like my parents took care of me you know i took care of them when they need to help things like that yeah and uh and now i've you know i went through through college did uh, associates and uh, well started in engineering science, and then was like, no, nah, I don't want to do this. So I switched back just to liberal arts to get a degree because that's what my parents wanted me to do. So mm -hmm. got it, and did this. I wish I did business. Where'd you go to school? Just MCC. Yeah, and uh, I'm glad I did that. No student loan debt. I mean, I had some, but I paid yeah, that off within a couple of years. You can pay for it right along yeah. the way. And my fiance, on the other hand, she. Uh, She's a physical therapist now. She just Is graduated. That right? Yeah, and uh, she's got a lot of debt. Whereabouts did she go to school? Um, she went well. First, she started at Nazareth, not going for physical therapy. Did two years at or one year at Naz. I graduated from high school. She's great above me, same age but great above me. And uh, then we went to MCC together for a year. Then she went to Brockport, and then she went to Damon. Okay. So. Yeah, so I spent a little time out in Buffalo from where you kind of where yeah. you're from now. And uh, she graduation or the grad school is crazy mm -hmm. expensive. So, dude, it's she, uh, pretty hilarious. My wife is a physical therapist. Okay. Went to, went to uh, Cornell okay. for undergrad, and then she went to 
UB for her yep. for her graduate program. So I smiled when you said that your wife's a physical therapist because it's exactly the exact same situation with me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, her student loan debt is stupid. Yeah. Like we we added it up because I want to re uh, refinance because her percentage is Sally May. Yeah. Is awful. Yeah. Like her average percentage from Sally May is like nine percent, mm-hmm. and it's like on a lot of money. Like yeah. it's not just ten grand. Oh <laughs> you yeah. Know what I mean, like you're talking like maybe uh, ten times. Uh, that. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, it's nuts, and I'm I'm glad I don't have anything. So now we can, can take help care of that. hers. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, so I'm glad I'm here though, and not chasing some other kind of no doubt or whatever. I mean, I've always well, wanted you control to do your this. own destiny here. Yeah. And it's a you know it's your passion. Yep. So that's that's pretty cool because yeah. if you're you know obviously you you grew up around this. You said it's the only job. Like it's yeah. And it, I envy what you've got here because it's it's uh it it is your passion. And I, you know, I'm in a similar situation. I've grew up around school buses like that. This is mm-hmm. my life. It's my passion. But I also have, you know, the outdoors comes second yeah. to that, you know, as far as things I'm passionate about. Yeah. So I've got my podcast. Yeah. But that's perfect. Yeah. It's uh, it's cool to see what you've done with this. It's cool to hear about your guys' journey with this place and what it's turned into. And, you know, it's one of the nicer shops I've ever been to. You've got a pretty awesome setup here. And Thank you. Yeah. I mean, my dad has done literally everything here. I mean... He had somebody build this barn, but everything inside was done by him. So he is, he's amazing with when it comes to that kind of stuff. He's yeah. literally done everything here and he, he's the type of guy, and that's how we do our archery. You know, you're going to do it, but you better do it right. Like that's how we've always, all my siblings have been taught that way. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, that's how I'm going to teach my kids someday, you know, do it right once. You don't have to do it again. You know, it's that simple. So that's what we try to do with everything in here, coaching, tuning, selling anything, you know, like you said, cry once or buy once, cry once. Yep. It's kind of the same thing. You know, we're going to tell you to do something if we think it's the perfect way to do it and and what to buy is, uh, you know, the best quality. I mean, that's what we, we do. Yeah. So I don't know. but No, you can you can tell that from just from being here and seeing how everything's organized and what you got going on. And, and I think that leads into something I want to, you know, what are the – what are the brands that you guys that you guys sell bow wise and then you know like arrows like the major accessories what do you guys sell here so hoyt and matthews are our top two brands we do uh some bow tech we do some elite um even though we're very close to elite's factory people that come here don't ask for elite that often so we don't stock too many um and uh, so our friend my friend glenn i was telling you about in uh tully up by syracuse Mm -hmm. he shoots for elite he's also a professional and they sell a bunch of of elite i mean obviously he shoots for him so you're going to sell more of what you represent but they come the people come in there asking for it like it's not that's interesting so yeah they also sell hoyt and matthews also they do a lot in those two but they do way more than us in elite and obviously they should because they're representing them but but it's weird. Like even Bowtech, we don't have a lot of guys coming in to ask about Bowtech. It's usually, honestly, it, I don't. I'm not gonna per- percentage to it, but people come in asking what we shoot or what we recommend. Yeah. And what I do, like you were telling me earlier, I say, okay, here's a Hoyt, here's a Matthews, here's a Bowtech, here's whatever else we have in here, and shoot them. You know, I'm. I obviously I'm gonna push for Hoyt. I enjoy my Hoyt. You know, tremendously. It's it's great. And there's no problems ever with them. But if that bow doesn't feel right in your hands, then you should shoot something that's going to feel right. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't think it's feeling well, you know, everything doesn't, you know, the string angle, grip, if that doesn't feel good, then you're, you know, your conscience is going to be like, okay, I'm not going to shoot good now. So then you're going to shoot bad. And that's how I think. Even though you could get used to it and do it, but I want something right off the bat that you're comfortable with. And then we can make you shoot the way you need to. I mean... Really, all these bow companies nowadays are top notch, most of them, I should say. Um, but you know, so you could shoot any. You know, you could shoot. Yeah, anything. they'll all tune. Yeah. It's not yeah. a matter of like, you know, this brand yep. tunes, this one doesn't. All yep. of these bows will tune. Yeah, it's, it's just, just some take more than others, honestly. But yeah. you know, that's with anything. Yeah. Um. Let me ask you this because I, when I went through my little journey that I was telling you about before we hit record and how I ended up picking out my bow last year was going to a shop and shooting a bunch of different bows. I was, I'm a big Cam Haynes fan. Mm-hmm. I was, 
I'm going to buy a Hoyt RX-3. It's what I'm going to buy. And it was a huge disappointment to me when I went to shoot it because I was getting a lot of, of uh, like, shock in my hand when yeah. I shot mm -hmm. and on the, on the carbon riser. Yeah. And in hindsight, after I went and shot those other brands, the Matthews and the, the Prime, and ended up ultimately picking the Prime, is that it is so hard to judge the feel of a bow when there's nothing on it, when there's no yeah. sight, there's no quiver, there isn't stuff weight yeah. so that's the thing that i came back around to maybe that rx3 would have felt would have felt great on yeah. me if it had some weight on that rise and that's what we we don't do as well like we we've always talked about okay we're going to set up one bow of each fully set up so people can feel it actually set up and we just never take the time because it's you know inventory you're also taking off that you're gonna have to sell for cheaper mm -hmm. so we don't want to do that too often but the engineers that we talk to the same thing if you put Anything on these bows, stabilizer, sight, quiver. Oh, stabilizer, I forgot to say yeah, that. Yeah. Are they're going to absorb all that other energy, so eventually they're going to feel the same. If not, I mean, you're still going to have one that feels better to you, but the vibrations should dumb it down a little bit. Yeah. And uh, then you get to feel what the actual bow is. You know, my bow, I got the RX-4 this year. I got the Ultra version. I like the longer bows. Okay. Because all my tournament stuff's 37 plus inches, so I'm used to it. Um, so the 34 uh, inch axle axle is really nice in my opinion i did the 80 percent mods and then i have a really heavy arrow this year not crazy heavy it's like 520 grains yeah so, but that's a good weight yeah it's um overall it's probably like 60 or 70 grains more than i was shooting last year i actually know less than that 50 50 grains but that thing is quiet you know all you set put up that weight on the yeah arrow i have there. i have bigger stabilizer on there from easton but i have easton bars um excel sight the accutouch um the Hoyt quiver and you know I have g I do sh I shoot for gas also and we do the, a lot of stuff through gas bow strings so I put some different strings on it too that thing is quiet like and it's at 75 pounds and you'd think it'd be loud but <laughs> no it's not that everything absorbs so much yeah. it's crazy this is probably the best feeling bow that I've ever had honestly yeah. and I and the reason I went with 80% is to get a little bit more speed, but I'm also used to 65% let off from my tournament, so I want a little more holding weight. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so you mean all the bows. That's, I'm glad I brought that up, too, because it's something that I've just been earning to get off my chest. Mm -hmm. that, but just kidding. But the, I like the PS, I, I like the Prime. But I, you know, I know deep down that that's what I that I went in there looking for the, yeah. for that. But then you, you know, you make your decisions. I was in such like a. Like I was just so worked up about getting a bow. I want a bow right yeah, now. Right now, yeah. And I, you know, I didn't think about that angle of it. I'm happy with my purchase. I shoot well with it. I'm comfortable mm -hmm. with it. But, you know, I don't feel that I, I had the exact experience with that bow, like with you, the yeah. Hoyt. You know, and like you wanted to. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. it wasn't explained. It was like, okay, go in the back room and here's four bows. Shoot it and mm -hmm. see what you decide. Yeah, you and know? everybody. So we have it in the retail spot. We just have a bail. That's in a corner of a room. So the bad part about that <laughs> is any bow you shoot sounds louder than it actually is. Right. Because the you know, audio, everything is yeah, it's bouncing everything. off right into your face, things like that. So I tell people, like, just feel the bow. They're really not that loud. It just sounds like they are right now. Because the bail is, you know, once you hit a bail at three, four feet, <laughs> it's loud. Yeah. You know what I mean? So people always get like, oh, that's a little louder. And I'm like, I know, but it's just because of this. <laughs> so, right. yeah, same thing. I mean. You not you don't know until you try it and until you get things on there. Mm -hmm. But it's also important to shoot them still to get the feel of grip. I think grip and string angle yeah. are and let off and draw cycle, those couple things are the best. You know, the mass weight of the bow isn't that important in my opinion. I like a little bit heavier bow. Mm -hmm. um, my tournament bow is at least ten pounds, so no I'm kidding. used to heavy. That's heavy. Yeah, so. I mean, there's people that are way heavier. Mikey Slosher out of the Netherlands, he has um, just his stabilizers, like the ends of his stabilizers, there's like 60-some ounces, 64 ounces. <laughs> He's got 30-some on the front and then the other on the back. Like, it's crazy. It's crazy amount of weight. And then he has like an 8-ounce stack on, on his bow to add to already a 4.5-pound bow. Wow. So, yeah, so weight's – some, for some people, it's not an issue. Other people, you have to work your way up to it. But but anyways, like Matthews, for instance, their bows are like 4.4, 4.5 pounds. Yeah. A Hoyt aluminum is a tad less. It's like 4.3, so it's a little less. But the carbon is like a half pound. 
So half pounds quite a bit. Um, but also the nice thing about taking that half pound off the bow, you can put it on the stabilizers or on the site and still have the same weight bow. Um, well, a, set, a couple accessories plus against just this bare bow. So that's what I like about the carbon series. I can put, like I did a 15 inch front bar, or 10 inch back bar this year with eight ounces on the front and six or seven ounces on the back. So I can take that half pound and put it on those bars and still be comfortable with it. Yeah. And it makes it feel way better, way better and way different than just a four and a half pound bow. Yeah. You know what I mean, so. Yeah, there's yeah. a ton of energy going through that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hindsight, that all makes sense as to why I was feeling what I was feeling there. But um, it, so we talked about bows, arrow wise. Um, what are you guys doing with arrows? We What's your. Literally just do Easton. Yeah. Uh, we're, we love Easton. Um, they're just the company alone is probably the biggest support of archery literally in in the industry they put more money into this sport than anybody else um and i'm pretty sure that's fact not just you know they Opinion. literally do so much i mean like we were talking about earlier the easton foundation um they used to own uh easton baseball stuff you yeah, know the gloves okay. bats or whatever they you know they made a whole bunch and they sold that and made the foundation oh. they have the Yankton facility in, s in uh, South Dakota. They have one in Florida and then one in Utah and one in California. All those are funded by Easton just alone. Like nobody else puts money into those buildings. Easton pays for them to be built and pays for all of their utilities and all their taxes, everything for the whole years, okay. every year, like literally. So they do a lot for the sport. So we are a big supporter of them. And they are, we think, the best arrow. I mean, Gold Tip is a very good competitor. Um, Carbon Express, um, they were a big competitor, but they kind of, they're still good. I mean, there's I've tuned bows with their new arrows, and they tune really well. But um, we, we like to support American-made stuff. And Easton, like 95 or 98% of their stuff is still made in the U.S., the other percentage is because the U.S. won't allow them to do it because of cer certain regulations of, you know, carbon, stuff like that. Like, different things they can't make here legally, so yeah. they have to do it somewhere else. But they try to do everything here. So that's what we like to support, like we were talking about earlier with yeah. broadheads and stuff like that. So. Yeah. But, yeah, and then um, we did sell gold, gold Tip for a little bit, but we just pushed everybody to Easton. Easton literally – that one company has any arrow you Yeah, need. they have an arrow yeah. in every category. So you well, multiple arrows yeah. in every category. Yeah. So that's what we like. And then accessories, we do Fuse, which is a site arrest company that um, Hoyt actually owns, and they engineer their own stuff for that, so that we do that. We um, have Excel Trueball. We have uh, Scott, we do some of their sites, or CBE, and then Scott releases... Um, but really Fuse and Excel is our top, top dogs. They, uh, Excel has not price point stuff, but if you want a high quality site, that's the way to go. And they have, now they, ha they went into the single pin game, multi pin movable, um, and then just regular multi pin. So y if you want really good quality stuff, that's, that's where we push them to. Um, Fuse is still really good product for like a hundred and twenty dollar site like if you want a hundred twenty dollar site that's one of the best in the game in my opinion they just don't advertise it ever like yeah. i was actually so much marketing yeah it, it is so i was actually talking with the engineer um we we're flying back from where were we flying back from one of the shoots this year uh, i think it was overseas actually i think uh, it was when i was coming back from europe in november um we were on a plane go back to paris and he actually is uh um recurve engineer but also does all the fuse line by himself huh. so he asked me about the fuse line i was like yeah it's a good line he's like oh well i i engineer that and i'm like well it's really good i mean i don't know why you guys don't advertise it more especially it's a dealer only so that helps dealers have a you know an edge on other people um and easton actually has done that recently easton backed out of all the big box stores. i noticed that yeah, yeah. so i was wondering why that was yeah th i think well they won't say it directly, but I think it is to help the dealer base. You know, they want – good. Because um, Greg Easton, the owner, it was it's a family business. So he has grown up just like, you know, from the roots, you know, want to keep it in the roots. 
and then grow it. You know, if you, the box stores kind of take that away from people. You know, they don't, the people that go to the box stores, there's nothing against them, but they just don't get the same experience as if you come to a shop that actually cares about you and it's not just another customer. You know, Bass Pro started off that way, you know, as a small shop and grew. And I, you know, it's great. He has 50 two or 53 stores all over all over the United States so it's crazy but when it gets to that point your quality does go down in in you know customer service you can't service. control it as yeah. much yeah, yeah. i mean it's so, just the reality yeah so you know i think Easton did that so people can get that experience again and just focus on the small guy for once cuz not a lot of people do that anymore no <laughs> in in any industry it's not just archery in any industry so yeah, no doubt 100% yeah the uh so what are you you're going to take a swig of water because hydration is key. Yeah. It's summertime. Yep. What, uh, what, what are you shooting for an arrow this year out of curiosity? Did you, did you like build one? For hunting? Or, yeah. You uh, said yeah. you went to a heavier arrow. Yep. So I, I've been shooting the FMJ, mm -hmm. um, but with these new bows with a six inch brace height, it, they all tend to want a stiffer arrow. So I went to a little bit stiffer FMJ, which is actually, so I did a 250 spine and the 300 spine actually weighs more than the 250 per inch really yeah and i think what they did they took away the aluminum wall thickness and added to the carbon okay so it lightened the arrow but also stiffened it so they could get thicker carbon wall yeah so i think that's how they they did that i'm not 100 percent sure because i haven't Makes asked sense. but that's what i would uh, excuse me that's what i would think so i did that 250 50 grain insert 100 grain point and i'm shooting the three inch silent nights on the back by flex fletch and I've only shot at 30 yards, and it shoots really, really well. Nice. Um, I shooting, um, I'm shooting, what was it, 274, 275 feet per second. Drawing 75 pounds? Yeah, yep. So I that's the one thing. My buddy was talking about um, adding more weight in the front of the, the arrow and things like that. So I was like, well, I'm not necessarily – um into a lot of front of center but i would like a heavier arrow so i i did best of both worlds i did a you know the fmj with a bigger fl vein on the back to add more weight there and then 50 grains on the front so i do have a good front of center it's like 13 percent may oh, actually less i think i think it's like 11 11 and a half which i think is great um, my tournament arrows are 10 and a half and they shoot crazy good like i messed around with arrows while we were in lockdown and that 10 and a half percent shot so well yeah, like i was very amazed and i mean last year i shot more percentage on the front and won outdoor nationals last year with a with a, that arrow and i so i took that arrow versus another arrow and that other arrow made it better so i was like man what what if i had that arrow i could have shot maybe better <laughs> i'm not saying i would have but <laughs> you know it's always nice to mess around with that stuff sometimes but um but yeah so i did that um and I don't uh, – have you heard the Ranch Ferry guy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he wants like 25% front of center. Yeah. I think that's a little ridiculous. So I, I didn't want to go that much. but And I also didn't want to go too slow because if it's too slow, your um, your drop at yeah. past 20 yards will be crazy. And I actually was talking to my buddy Glenn, the one up in uh, Tully. He was like, yeah, there was a guy that did an experiment with a lot of front of center, heavy arrow, Versus a regular 450 grain arrow with 10% front of center and whatnot. And at 40, f uh, 40 yards, or sorry, yeah, 40 yards, this guy aimed with his 35-yard pin. Did the lighter arrow. Shot like 3 to 6 inches. I forget what it was. Maybe like 5 inches low at, at that distance. And uh, took the heavy arrow and hit 3 feet low. Yeah, so that, that point where it's, you yeah, really start losing yeah, energy is... people don't realize like this this guy i mean i'm not trying to bash him or anything but like he's saying tune your bow with a heavy point but okay let's say you get it tuned but you're gonna miss three by three feet if you're off five yards right. like yeah that's you better be careful with how you shoot and what the yardage is because if you don't you're either gonna wound something or you're gonna miss every time if you don't make a perfect shot mm -hmm. so that's where speed does help in hunting not a lot of speed because if you have too light of an arrow, it's going to do the opposite. It's not going to penetrate, things right. like that. So, um, so yeah, I just – I went a little bit heavier but kept the speed so I don't have to worry yeah, about drop too much. It's like anything. Like when this whole front of center like craze came out, 
mm-hmm. you're listening to people talking about it, you're like yeah it makes perfect sense like so much more you got you basically you got a a baseball being thrown with like you know with that's yeah. dra- dragging the arrow and it's just gonna you've got the arrow behind it and wherever it doesn't matter what's going on in the back that ball is gonna hit where you're throwing it yeah like it's like the theory of it and then how much penetration or devastation you could get even if it was a bad hit this and that shoulders blowing through them with a super heavy arrow like it all sounds great yeah but then you got to look at you got to look at other sides of it Mm -hmm. and i've kind of taken the the stance of like i've found myself that kind of that middle of the road just exactly what you're saying i have no idea what my front of center is Mm -hmm. but my arrow is 537 grains yeah i probably my bow is probably 255 260 feet per second i'm not yeah pulling i'm only pulling when i'm hunting 70 pounds but you got to look at like what you're trying to accomplish. If you're going out west, and you might be shooting 70 to 100 yards, that's gonna be a big you drop. You need to be arrow. figuring yeah. out how this stuff's gonna perform. Yeah. And thinking about that because that's a huge factor. Mm-hmm. You know, but if you're hunting around here and you're hunting whitetail, or if you're down south hunting pigs, yeah. and your shots are all under 20 yards, yeah, then you can. It's a different yeah. conversation. You Up have to, to 20 like, yards. You could use anything. Yeah, basically. Depending on the animal and penetrate and get through and right. not have to worry about anything else but if you're going to shoot 30 35 40 50 60 70 80 yards yeah you know that thing i mean it doesn't it's not like a gun (laughs) you know it doesn't just hit right behind the pin every time no matter if you're 10 yards closer or 10 yards further you know you don't have that much speed so right um so yeah people yeah there's there's a lot of factors there and i think there was a big push for speed for years Mm -hmm. in archery and then now it's going back to more of the yeah. performance side of it as far as the killing or whatever yep. you're trying to achieve. And it blows me away when I sit and shoot my buddies and I was the first one to go with like a heavier arrow. And at first I was shooting the FMJ at like 425 grains and that yeah. was considered heavy yeah. like five years ago. Mm-hmm. And then now I'm shooting a, a day six arrow and it, I'm at that 537 grains, like I said. And that thing, when I shoot next to my buddies who are shooting – you know, a 380 to a 400 grain arrow, the yeah. difference in the noise of that bow going oh, yeah. off is dramatically different. Well, if you listen to a crossbow shooting yeah. 350, 400 off. feet per second, that arrow is still only, I think most of them are about 400 grains with, yeah. a, with a field point, maybe a little bit more, and they're super loud, yeah. you know, so it's it's not going to always, and people with the, with a the speed thing back in the day, oh yeah, we're going to, the deer's not going to jump my string this year, and it's like, no, they can actually jump this, jump any string. Oh, yeah. You know, a gun is the only thing that you cannot, you know, they cannot jump or dodge. You know what I mean? So, um, we never got on that bandwagon. That's we always have done this. Literally, we've always done the same arrows, same hundred grain field point. Because everybody was like, "Oh, we need 75, 85. No, no. And that's how, like you were saying with the baseball, that's how we would tell people with like broadheads um, and weight. So, it, what we would tell people. This was from my dad. He would say, okay, let's say you have the sharpest broadhead in the world, right? And you take it and put it on a straw and you throw it at me. Yes, I'm going to be a little bit scared because it's sharp and it's going to hit me and hurt me. But imagine if you put it on a steel rod and threw it at me. I'm running away. You're in trouble. You know, yeah, you're, that's going to hit you and go through you a lot easier and a lot quicker. So, um, that's how we've always done. And wiffle ball to baseball. Take a wiffle ball and you throw it at me, it's going to hit me, sting me. If you take a baseball and throw it at me, that thing's going to leave a mark. No doubt. You know what I mean? So that's how we've always done it. That's literally the exact words we've told I don't know how many different customers for the last 14 years. Yeah. Like that's been our thing forever. And uh, we were always a big thing on, uh, on uh, feathers too. And that kind of um, – that went away because not a lot of people want to – mess around and refletch every year things like that they want a, a vein to be durable and i've i've switched to veins i've had no problems um but there's benefits and cons to everything so but yeah so it's it's all messy when you talk about a whole bunch of different stuff but yeah it's really cool to see a young you know you're a young guy how old are you uh 25 yeah personal question but i'm gonna ask anyway so 25 year old guy that you know you're very in tune with what's going on in the industry mm-hmm. and you're you're traveling and shooting i had no idea we, we know what your stature is of that so you're traveling all over the world and shooting yeah. with all these yeah i traveled first time last year to europe and i was over there for two weeks and shot two tournaments 
It was awesome. I'm, awesome. I'm glad I got to do it before the COVID hit. No <laughs> doubt, yeah. So, because now everything's canceled for this, because I would go again in November, mm -hmm. but it's going to be canceled. Or it already is canceled, actually, so. Yeah. But, yeah. But it's you're very in tune, and I think that's the one thing that when you go into a pro shop, you know, it's important. Like, that, I feel like what you have going here, and I may find that, that I'm wrong, but I my experience in the past with pro shops was not being, you know, as in tune with what's going on outside of, those three different arrows that you sell and mm -hmm. the, the bows that you have on the shelf. Yeah. You know, it seems like you're pretty well in tune with what's going on in the yeah. industry, what some of the fads are, what some of the trends are. Yeah, we are. try to follow everything because um, if something is better, then we'll do it. Like that we're not afraid to change something because um, like bows are not even bows, but just anything. Like if something is better and it's going to make me shoot better or make me impact a deer better i'm gonna try it at least and if it does make a difference for me then i'll do it but you know we're not going to be the people who just says oh no we're not we're not changing our ways at all because that's not the way to do i mean everything is evolving yeah. on its own pace and some's for the better some's for the worst but you have to just weed that stuff out you know once you go through it so but yeah we always try to make it make everything better i yeah. mean i'm not afraid to say i'm wrong and you're right you know it's just what happens yeah you know, everybody it goes back to what you were uh your dad was saying earlier is that you just try to learn something new mm -hmm. every time you're with someone there's yeah. there's something to learn yep you know and that's that's awesome you yeah. know you might have a customer come in here and turn you on to a product that you didn't even know was out there yep and next thing you know it's it's that's what you yeah are using that's what i'm what doing the believe. broadhead this year so we'll see yeah if it works <laughs> yeah i'd be interested in seeing that I, i've heard the name but i haven't i don't know if i've yeah. seen the broadhead they the, uh seen it. they are a lot smaller than I anticipated. They're only a 0.91 inch cutting diameter, so they're under an inch. No kidding. Yeah, but um, but I didn't realize how much more they or how much smaller they look than just a little over an inch. Yeah. You know what I mean, so, but hey, if it punches a hole, I've seen a bunch of tests done for like blood trails, things like that. I've watched people use it on pigs, things like that, and there's decent it's blood a three trails. Three still. blade or yep, three blade. Yep. So we'll see. I don't know. It looked a lot bigger in pictures for so. sure it always does oh, yeah. man <laughs> that's uh like my the broadhead i was telling you guys that i'm shooting it's uh it's only i think it's inch and three eighths yeah but it's got it's a two blade mm -hmm. and it but it's got a bleeder on each side is that the bleeders. smaller one they make too yeah they they just came out with a i don't know if what they call it um i should know off the top of my head but it's a it's a larger yeah essentially it's almost a two inch okay cut now because i think it's like an inch and three quarters and then the bleeders are a little bit larger oh, okay. so it's almost like a a cumulative two inch yeah. diameter cut but you know you'd be amazed when that's small i mean it is it's a small broadhead with just two blades but those bleeders you're basically it's a, sh it's, a it's a slug hole yeah because it's going through and it's cutting all the way around and those mm -hmm. bleeders are just you know the blood trails are fantastic that buck yeah. i shot he was at eye level on a side hill at like 15 yards mm -hmm. and you know it was real steep side hill and i was shooting basically straight at him on the side hill and i heart shot him back of the heart and both lungs and uh and the blood trail was just unbelievable yeah i mean it was like Im instant immediate and just blowing out everywhere yeah and that's one thing i've heard with the iron wheels like great blood trail but also great flight and that's what yeah. i look at, that's what i look for any broadhead if it's a mechanical or a fixed if it flies good mm -hmm. and it hits good and makes makes them die quicker yeah that's perfect that's all i need yeah. and that's even some of the simplest broadheads out there like really the iron will is bleeder blades that not a lot of people do anymore it's either a three blade or four blade or a mechanical two you know two blade so they're going back to the old bleeders when that was a big thing 15 years ago at least you right. know so it's the simple stuff always works I th yeah most of the time better yeah i mean you're, you're paying time, top line there but you're the yeah. the tolerances are so incredibly mm -hmm. tight where you could get a pack of a generic broadhead off the shelf uh, shelf that's a uh, might have a larger cutting diameter but they may have you know a bat they might not have the tolerances yeah so this batch might spin well and might fly well but then the next batch doesn't yeah you know, if and or broadhead to broadhead could mm -hmm. be different yeah so that's where with this like i i am so far from being able to tune my own bow i am not good with that stuff you know and it's just a matter of you run out there and i hope my you know you shoot with your broadheads you shoot with your field points you hope they fly the same yeah. and for that those two it you know and i'm not shooting out past with a couple of broadheads i'm not shooting out past 40 yards yeah it's just not what i'm doing it's not where my confidence is it's not where the situations often bring me with mm -hmm. whitetail but um yeah, yeah I, I don't i 
I've never killed a deer past 28 yards, I think. And I've never, not yet at least, I have never was like, okay, if that deer comes to 45, I'm going to take a shot. Like, I've never had to worry, like, worry about that. Like, when they come in, I've just been lucky enough where they've come in between 30 and 20 or even less, you know. So, um, but I don't think I'd ever really take a shot past 40, especially, because even though I shoot all the time, I just, it's an animal. Yeah. If they m- take one step forward at 40 yards, that's a big difference in inches from 20 to 40, you know, oh, yeah. that that step is. So, um, and depending on what your setup is for speed, if how much it's going to affect that. So, yeah, like like you said, I would never take a shot over 40. I don't think. Yeah. I don't think I'd even take a Especially shot over 30. Especially on whitetail. Yet. Whitetail yeah. are so keyed in. Even when they're stopped and they're feeding, I mean – they can react so fast it's not even funny that's yeah. where you go out west and it's a totally different game out there i don't know if you have you hunted out west at all or i went to illinois once but not so not like out, not out west west, west yeah. yeah but yeah. yeah and i mean that's it's and it's just so much different out there i mean you get out and you know 100 yards doesn't look far when you're in mm-hmm. these just monstrous mountains or the open yeah. wide open flatlands like it everything's just different out there but yeah you know, when you're talking if you're somebody listening to this, that's probably most, it is most of the people listening to this are New Yorkers mm-hmm. hunting in the timber or on the edge of a field. Like yep. your opportunities to shoot over 40 yards are, are you slim. know, and so if you're watching, if you're learning and you're watching and most of your stuff's coming from people on YouTube that are, there's a lot of content from people, oh good yeah. content from people out, out West, but that is not the reality that what we, yeah. s- what we experience here. Yeah. And so. like the campaigns, you said you're a big fan. Um, I don't follow them too much. Um, but he, one thing I really like that he does, yes, he shoots out to 120 yards, and I'm not saying go do that, but I like his m- mentality of if I can hit this group at 120 yards, then I'm comfortable to shoot at 60 yards. Yeah, no doubt. So that I, I really like because I always tell people, shoot at 60 yards, practice at 60, because when you walk up to 20, it's going to be night oh, and day like, oh, sh- boom, done. Even practicing all the time, at I, I, my deck to where I put my target is 30 yards. Mm-hmm. And then I, when I go up there and I take a few shots at 10 yards, yeah. it's like, <laughs> it's, like <laughs> it's right there. Nothing. And almost yeah. all of my archery opportunities in the last four years, four or five years, have been 10 yards and under. Mm-hmm. And those are the shots that you you know that are sometimes the easiest. There's such a – yeah, you, it's just the littlest mistake can, yeah. can cost you. And yep. it has cost me a pile of times. And they've been well documented. Is that the guard dog? Yeah. Look at that thing. All right. You're not that scary. Pull one foot off the ground. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Um, are most of these most of these mounts in here, are these your dad's or people um, you guys know so or yours? These two are these three. The first three are Bob Folkrods. Okay. Um, the double drop tine is a Pennsylvania buck, then a Michigan buck, and then Texas. The next one is dad's. Um that's from Texas. And then the other one between the turkeys is mine from Texas. That's uh, a beauty. Yeah. That was what is that, a 14-pointer? Uh, 13. Oh, who's counting? Yeah. That's <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was a fun trip. We got to go with some buddies, and it was a really good time. Yeah. And then the little Jake is my first bird, I believe. And the next turkey is Dad's uh, birthday bird, like five years ago now. Maybe nice. even Maybe even longer than five years ago. But the elk is uh, just a friend, and this bear, uh, Daryl True, he uh custom home builder, so he's gone on a bunch of different hunts. That elk and I, the other elk in the other room is his, and there's a moose over there, too. He killed a really nice moose. Nice. So, uh, but yeah, and then the other, my, we have some more deer mounts over there. My grandma has one over there, um, a nice 10-point from probably seven years ago. My mom's got one. My dad's got two or three over there yeah three i think and then i have my first doe went to texas when i was 11 and i seen the pictures doe. in the bathroom that yeah. feels like you guys had a pretty good time yeah on that, hunt. that was a long time ago yeah but that was really fun i got to go with bob then too uh so yeah it was good it was a fun time it's great um yeah. i would like to like to hear your first buck story if you got, they've kind of okay. created a little bit of a routine out of asking everybody to tell their yeah. first buck story. So. so I literally did not shoot my first buck with a bow until I think I was 16 or 17. Oh, I think it was 16. I passed on plenty of deer. I can show you a picture of it too while I tell the story. Um, so actually my my good friend Cundin, he, uh, he hunts our property with us and 
he was like, are we going to go out tomorrow morning? I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't really want to go hunting. And he was like, just go. Like, just come with me and just go and go sit in the skull tree stand, which is my dad's tree stand. From he, It's been in the same spot for literally probably 25 years, literally since I, you know, it's been there for a, a long time. So I was like, fine, I'll go. And uh, so we get in there about where we have a big swamp. So it takes a while to get back in there. So I'm in the tree stand before 7 o'clock, probably about 6 o'clock, I'd say. I like to get in there an hour before. And we sat there, and I'm on my phone, you know, tucked into my shirt so the light doesn't shine. And I'm on my phone, and then it hits 7 o'clock, and I put my phone away. I look up and look around, get my phone back out, and then look up again a couple minutes later, and I see this buck. And I'm like, oh, dang, like, that's a, that's a pretty nice buck. So I put my phone away. And uh, I get up, grab my bow, and he's walking, feeding a little bit, walk a little bit more, stops, and there's no shot. Like, it's thick in there. So he turned, walked right towards me, came to 20, I think it was like 22 yards, I want to say, a little quarter and two, not crazy, but he came over. So I actually drew back, and I came down on him, and I, like, ginched because I was nervous. You know, yeah, yeah, first, of first time going to be drawn on a buck, and – so I ginch like I'm gonna punch him. I'm like, okay, calm down. Like, <laughs> don't do anything stupid. Yeah. So I regathered myself a little bit, never let down, and he stopped. His head was behind a tree. So I was just like, boom, double lunged him. He turned around, thirty yards, stopped. Look, he was looking around, and I'm, sh- you know, I'm shaking. Oh yeah. And then he just goes, whoop, tips, and down. And I was like, right in front of so you. The, so you got to see him go down. Yeah. So the best part is my buddy Condon that was with me that day. He was about 100 yards away from me in another tree stand. We, it's like this little spot that we like to hunt either side. And uh, he actually heard the arrow go through the deer. Like, because it was, uh, I mean, it, it literally was two minutes after sunlight. Yeah. So, like. It was dead quiet. Yeah. So, dead quiet, nothing going on. And and boom, just it happened. And he, he literally called me right away. And I was like, what was that? Was that you? And I was like, yep. <laughs> so, it was, that was, Yeah. 16 and that was my first one that's awesome. and um i'll show you a picture if i can find one the it's so funny that you, that that's a setup you had that day too because we talked about that on the podcast i posted today we were t- i was talking with uh brian in dallas and my brother-in-law aj the few of my hunting buddies and we do that a lot we hunt fairly close to each other oh damn that's yeah. a really good buck yeah he's for your first year like 137 oh that's not a big deal yeah. or anything that i, I first got buck. lucky i mean really i've I've been pretty lucky with our property. My grandparents have owned it for a long time. That's so. awesome. But yeah, that. Uh, but hunting one. hunting close to other people sometimes you feel like it's a bad thing. But some yeah, of the yeah. best hunts that I've ever had have been hunting almost hundred yards or less mm-hmm. than somebody else. Yeah, because you never know where the deer is going to come from, anyway. So it's hard to really tell unless you're on a field or something and you have them patterned or yeah. you know where they're bedding things like that. Like. Then you, it's a little bit different, but yeah. you know, in our swamp, it's literally 200 acres of just swamp. It can go yeah. wherever. Yeah, and that's our property that we own. It's still, I bet the whole property of the the big lot is like 500 acres. I bet at least, like of just swamp. So it, you know, deer walking wherever they want to walk. It's right. not like, you know, this year actually, I'm trying to f- put some food plots in there, just little ones, like kill plots, I guess you want yeah, to call it. Just to bring them in. Yeah, because uh, you know. There we have fields all over us of corn or soybeans, depending on the year. And but I want something in there where they don't have to leave, because I'd rather have them stay in there, eat, right, and sleep. Or they stop there on their way to the destination yeah. food or whatever. Yep, exactly. So we're gonna try to do that. I'd, a little late to do it, but trying to get some That's not late, late season ones That's not at least. Late, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're just getting around to doing our doing our stuff. Probably gonna plant our food plots on the farm, and we're putting in a couple little kill plots. I mean, we're in farmland where my, yeah. my in-laws property is. And so like you can go out and, and spend all this money on food plots, or you can just let the, you know, several hundred acres of corn and soybeans that's around you. Just let that yeah. be their food. But we're putting in a few uh, small food plots this year. And yeah. And it's, it's fun. Like I'm learning, there's actually a guy from Tully. Okay. Um, his name's John Teeter, um, okay. Whitetail Landscapes. So he started this business within the last year, you know, helping, like helping people, do their own food plots and manage their property and come up with, uh, you know, with like a management plan as far as timber yeah. and things like that. 
So we've been doing quite a bit with him on the podcast and learning from him about, That's you know, cool. the yeah. soil and what type of stuff to plant and how to do, you know, like regenerative style, like mm-hmm. no-till food yep. plots and stuff. So we're learning a ton from him yeah, and just cool. somebody we connected with here yeah, on the podcast. Yeah, we actually have a friend, a uh, younger kid, about my age, maybe a little older than me, Ben Williams. He, uh, I know Ben. Old, old Tin Cup. Is yep. Or I forget. I like to just call it Old Tin Cup. Yeah. It's a little bit longer name, but – he uh he helps us out too. Yep. And he's I've probably gonna be yeah. pissed at me because he told me that we were gonna we were gonna coordinate and have him come here because him and I are gonna do a podcast together too. Okay. Yeah. QDMA stuff and yep. talk about things like that. Yeah. He so. started that around here. We didn't get to have the dinner this year, but last year it was his first one. He did a really good job. It yeah. was really fun. Um, but yeah, he helps us out a bunch with everything. Just and he has a lot of social media stuff he does that mm-hmm. helps quite a bit. So we're gonna do some more. We have farmland that farmers do but then we have these little fields that we're going to try to do too he's going to help us out with what to put there and whatnot nice so a little lakes i would love an all-year plot but also i want really late plot would be yeah ideal some so something that they can yeah. eat once the temperatures get yep. down and no doubt so yeah well it's uh we're going on we're at an hour and a half so nice. that's 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 a good it's good length yeah. I know we could sit here and talk more, and I, I definitely <laughs> um, really nice getting to know you guys. And I, the same. I guess I'll let you kind of close out the podcast with you know, kind of telling people where they can find you, how yeah. to communicate with you guys. So um, heritageoutdoorsports.net, um, you can find us on there. Uh, if you just Google Heritage Outdoor Sports also, it'll pop up. And then Facebook, we have a page, um, Instagram. So, yeah, yeah, anywhere on there, you get a hold of us. Um, get directions to come here yeah <laughs> things and as like far that. as like your dad with the academy um yep so that folks can go on the website is yeah so he has a separate website it's heritage archery academy okay um so you can look up that google it he also has a facebook page for that and i think he has an instagram for that also he runs all that part okay. so but yeah we definitely have a um web page for that so, so if somebody's interested out. in the academy side of it yep. go check that out and i'm sure from from the outdoor sports side of it you can probably find if you're in yeah, one you could probably find the I think other there's a connection page i believe yeah. but I, didn't do the website I, I think i'm my mind's turning i think i might take you up on you know or take your dad up on coming in here and yeah. getting a little coaching from him because yeah. i want to i want to continue to get to be a better shooter and i know i've got some serious deficiencies in that so i'd love to get somebody to show me the light and yeah we can throw the out. camera on me and tell me what i'm doing and yeah for sure get a little better so yeah, it's been great getting to sit down and chat with you guys. Yeah, it has been. And uh, we'll we'll get together again maybe sometime during deer season and see how, how things are going if you've yeah put the big one on the ground yet or not. Okay, so, sounds right. good. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's been no fun. Problem. Thank you. Right, see ya.